The world of entertainment has gotten pretty cozy with making remakes of original movies. Producers and writers strive to make them more... <clears throat> ...modernized. The video game industry is no different. It's also been remaking older games from about 10 or 20 years ago. So it's becoming a popular project to make. Whether it's to update a much older game for modern systems, or make something entirely different with some similarities. It's a very difficult development process as a remake will always be compared to its predecessor. They are often ridiculed for the removal of content or a change in mechanics or storytelling something that remakes often do to differentiate themselves from the original project. If a remake essentially recreated everything, I would expect an argument against said remake to be that the consumer is basically buying the same game. So I would argue that some changes or additions have to be made. This can include changes in the music, voice acting, story, and gameplay with the only exclusion being graphics as that kind of change normally doesn't make a remake what it is. Today I'll be taking a look at some remakes that have been made, ranging from Resident Evil's very own remakes to a few other remakes worth noting. As a side note, I will be talking about key story points in some of these games. So if you're looking to avoid spoilers, feel free to skip to the next chapter in the video's timeline. The topic at hand is to see what video game remakes can bring to the table from their original project. It's not too different from a movie remake. Some things are removed, some things stay. The easiest point to make for video game remakes is that the developers must respect what came before. Otherwise, the remake weakens its potential and authenticity, as players call it a cash grab. Hopefully that's not going to be the case, as many of these video games I'll be looking at are going to be a first-time experience. Now, does that mean I'd like to see remakes do the same exact thing as the original? No. I'd like to see the remake improve as much as possible, and present new challenges and mechanics, but at least be faithful and preserve what came before. This will be an insight as to what direction remakes in the past have taken, and how far the industry has come since its much older titles. So let's dive right in. Before we get started, there's a distinction we have to make before delving into specific remakes, and that is the three RE's, Remake, Remaster, and Reimagining, terms that you may or may not have heard of. The easiest one of the three to differentiate is Remaster, which is basically updating an older title with new graphical improvements for modern systems. A port of an older game in some cases, Remakes rebuild an entire game from the ground up, whether they keep the same mechanics and story is a question to ponder on during its development. The other term is called a reimagining, and I'll be honest, this one confuses me to no end. It's described as something that indicates a greater discrepancy between what it's based on. Doesn't that essentially mean it's just a remake with a lot of changes? That would also mean it could add value to its gameplay, story, or whatever else it made additions to. Or on the other hand, being unfaithful to the source material. It's confusing, since it's not a synonymous term, plus it doesn't sound like a term to use as a marketing title. For example, imagine if you heard this title, Final Fantasy VII Reimagine. Anyways, a little bit of differentiation I had to make before diving in. We'll be focusing on remakes specifically and what their history has been overall with various titles. The danger of remakes are basically changes that would alter what made the original game unique and special to players. The design, story, and content. Making changes is a very difficult balance to make work. On one hand, it can add to the original, such as adding scenes for context or drama. And then on the other hand, changing or removing these can cause the reception to be negative for a remake, making players wonder if the remake was even necessary. It's a very difficult balance to maintain. So let's see how these titles deal with it, starting off with the franchise that kicked off the rise of video game remakes. Resident. 
Evil. Starting off with Capcom's very first Resident Evil of the franchise, made back in 1996 with a remake made in 2002 on the Nintendo GameCube, only to be ported on later systems in 2015. Both are directed by the creator of the series, Shinji Mikami, who decided to work on the remake due to the age of the original, and to create something more closer to his original version years ago. Once players have selected either Jill Valentine or Chris Redfield, our playable characters, there will be a cutscene filling in the details of the story. You're part of Alpha Team in the STARS unit from Raccoon City, sent to investigate what happened to Bravo Team, who were investigating a case of murders near the Arclay Mountains. The original uses live action to set the stage, and yes, just as many other people have mentioned in their videos, the dialogue is delivered in such a special way. No! Don't go! Disregarding the obvious, the cutscene isn't all that bad in the original once the action starts. Everything goes into chaos as Alpha Team is ambushed by a group of zombie dogs. One of the team's members, named Joseph, has a rough time. There's not much time taken to let the tension build, and even if there was, the next cutscene is. well. it's different. Chris Redfield. Jill Valentine. Barry Burton. Rebecca Chambers. Albert Wesker. Resident Evil. This game is just something special. <laughs> The remake uses CGI models instead and takes its time sparingly before kicking things off. The remake even adds in a small scene for Jill where she tries to save Joseph. After the cutscene ends, we're inside the Arclay Mansion, and here is a good spot to talk about the voice acting. What is this? Wow! What a mansion! The original Resident Evil is infamous for its dialogue delivery in many spots, and this is due to a mishap on Capcom's part back then. The script was simply translated from Japanese to English, without any editing since that would probably throw off the timing in animations. A translation problem, basically. But I'll be honest, I love the cheesy dialogue. It adds a different kind of charm to it. Just a moment! I found something! What is it? It's a weapon! It's really powerful, especially against living things. Better take it with you. But how about you, Barry? I have this. There are some dialogue bits that are delivered well for a serious story to take place, but they're few and far between. Obviously, the remake doesn't have this problem as much as the original, minus a few scenes that have some strange dialogue. <laughs> Jill and Barry, together. In hell, the ultimate life form, Tyrant. <laughs> Wesker, you've become senile! In some cases, they do harken back to the dialogue in the original, so there's that. Oh, Barry! That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. <laughs> You're right! Barry! That was a close one. A second late, you would have fit nicely into a sandwich. Let's move on to the design changes. It's a rather surprising comparison to look at when you think about the time gap of 1996 to 2002. A surprisingly small amount of time, all things considered. The original Resident Evil has that polygon design one would expect from the PlayStation 1 era of graphics, and the rest of the game's design are pretty colorful for a horror experience, which really makes the monsters you encounter stick out more. The remake dips toward a more darker and desaturated color scheme for pretty much everything. It's a creepy atmosphere to be in and unnerving at times. Surprisingly, both the original and remake use static backgrounds. Not a discovery I made. Take a look for yourself on Slippy Sly's video on the remake. 
The music in the original Resident Evil tries to provide a creepy and mysterious atmosphere, but doesn't get much farther than a few tracks due to the mid-90s limitations. The remake manages to make the music lean toward a darker tone, taking some of the notes and lowering the tone by a few steps, plus adding this background essence of dread throughout most of the soundtrack. It's also worth mentioning that the remake gets to use lighting for shadows used out of the camera's viewpoint, just to add to the creepy atmosphere. Even with the fixed camera angle that Resident Evil is known for, there's plenty of decorum to appreciate in the remake, as opposed to the original. The gameplay for both games is pretty much the same. Both use an ink ribbon system for manual saving. For the original, I stuck with the director's cut, which has some better control schemes and adjustments, making the original much easier to get into with the DualShock controller. As for controls, Chris and Jill move with tank-like movement, and have an auto targeting system to make things easier. Both games have similar traits for both playable characters. Minus one difference. Chris and Jill have a different item granted to them for free in the remake. Jill being the... well... Barry says it better than me. Here's a lockpick. It might be handy if you, the master of unlocking, take it with you. Chris starts with a lighter that makes it easier to bypass an entire puzzle, so players don't have to use a slot in their inventory, something Chris struggles with as Jill has more space in her inventory, traded for less health. The original has Chris look for the lighter, so he basically starts with little to nothing in his inventory, as for the weapons, the shotgun has its uses in both games and is your best friend. If players aim upward and fire as a zombie closes in, it counts as a headshot. The shotgun might be your best friend, but conserving ammo is paramount in Resident Evil, so stockpiling what you can is always going to benefit you in the long run. In the original game, the zombies aren't going to be as threatening since players can just kill them and move on. Nothing respawns, so you'll end up saving yourself the trouble of dodging an attack. Dodging zombies can be rewarding in both games, but if you get grabbed in the original, there's not much players can do but take the damage. The remake adds in defense weapons like knives, grenades for Chris, and a taser for Jill. With this, players can safely risk saving ammo without a fight, and not take damage from an attack. The remake does something very interesting with the zombies. Occasionally, players will find notes suggesting a different variant of the zombies, and you'll be given a lighter and kerosene to burn the bodies. You might wonder why that is. Yeah, that's why. The Crimson Head Zombies. What a cool idea. A more aggressive and dangerous version of the more monotonous and ordinary walker zombies. They're faster, do more damage with their claws, and sound even scarier too. They make things a lot more difficult if you don't have the shotgun locked and loaded, with plenty of ammo on hand. Other than the combat, the remake adds more areas and locations. Some puzzles are moved in different locations and changed to keep veterans of the original game on their toes. Players won't be playing the same exact game thanks to these changes, making it a unique experience for horror enthusiasts. Solving puzzles is the other half of the game. Both versions allow players to examine items that will aid them with little details hidden on the models. Pretty much every item can be examined to give a brief summary of what the item does, or what the player can deduce through investigation. A very neat bit of gameplay to break up the combat. Each puzzle solved aids the player into progressing through the story, escaping this nightmare. Story-wise, many of the story beats from the original have transferred over to the remake unscathed, minus a few changes. For example, the remake doesn't have players decide on as many choices as the original did, 
each leading to a different ending. The requirement for those endings usually result with keeping your partner Rebecca Chambers alive in Chris's story, or Barry goddamn Burton in Jill's story. Some other changes in the story include Richard of Bravo Team. The original has him die due to poison, but in the remake, if the cure is brought to him in time, Richard will help Jill in the snake boss fight, and thus sacrifice himself to save her, or save Chris in a short cutscene. The original Richard just hands Jill a radio when she brings him the cure, which isn't really important, as it's revealed to be broken in a later cutscene. Additionally, the remake adds a completely new character into the mix that adds to that creepy factor. Lisa Trevor. Players can read up on Lisa's horrific history within the mansion via some notes. She acts as a minor antagonist that appears around three or four times to impede Jill or Chris, one of them being a boss battle. Lisa's motivation is that she's looking for her mother after years of inhumane experimentation, a tragic story layered into the Arglay mansion. Subjectively, I would have preferred Lisa acting like a constant threat, but that might have added too much weight to the difficulty. As for the rest of the story, much of what takes place is the same, with Wesker betraying the stars teams in the last few scenes. The story in the remake adds in a few new scenes for Barry to attempt to show him being the traitor, but there's more than enough hints to suggest Wesker as well. The original game surprisingly has some dialogue to suggest Wesker being genuinely shocked by Chris's survival, as if he's glad to see him. Chris! You're alive! My words exactly! The remake shows a more calm and collected Wesker, and even throws him alongside Chris to fight Lisa Trevor. As for the betrayal scene, the dialogue's changed, but I won't lie. I prefer the original. This is the ultimate life form. Tyrant! <laughs> Chris? <laughs> Stop it! Just the thought of Wesker having his feelings hurt by Chris laughing at him is worth it. As for the ending, the original and remake are almost exactly the same, minus the live action swap for the in-game models. There are a lot of endings based on player strategy and choices determining who escapes with Chris or Jill. Both Barry and Rebecca can die in the original and remake, though the remake seems to have made this less difficult as the original had a few more choices in between maps. Overall, the story has been given some improvements, even with some bits and pieces cut out. It's a very simple story. The hero is trapped in the creepy mansion and has to find a way out, but also solve the mystery about the Arclay mansion. The original Resident Evil has been scarred by time, as older titles can be, but has a well-made remake keeping the original intact with the same mechanics, similar story, and a new coat of paint to stimulate that horror atmosphere. These two games can show how faithful a remake can be at preserving its predecessor, and update it for a new player base. The remake of Resident Evil is a very good example at preserving the original, keeping the series as a major horror titan, one that wouldn't see another remake until years later. Resident Evil 2. 2019 was an interesting year for Resident Evil. The series had been on a quiet hiatus after Resident Evil 6. Capcom was moving back to the horror aspect of Resident Evil with a new entry and later on would have a remake of the original sequel from 1998 that was on the PlayStation 1, Windows System, N64, and Dreamcast. Much of the same atmosphere changes are the same as the first game. The remake's design is much darker and creepier as the original is given enough brightness to make everything out, so we won't take much time on that. This time around, live-action motion capture has been incorporated for cutscenes in these remakes, instead of manually crafted animations. The 2019 remake of Resident Evil 2 uses the RE engine, an engine that is directed to make the remake look more cinematic and detailed. The remake opens up Raccoon City as soon as it can, but to such a small extent with small hordes of zombies that there's not much to do at all but get to point B for the next cutscene while the original stuck to tight alleyways and corridors due to tech limitations. Plus a short cutscene with a survivor and a gunshot. As for the models, most of their designs are pretty close to the original design, minus one monster in the later portions of the game, which are the plant monsters in the underground umbrella lab. The remake has them similar to the zombies of old, but with an instant kill move instead, while the original just poisons the player. A weird choice, but I believe the developers are trying to make it look like the remake versions are the origin point of the infection. 
There's also the G-Adult that's been added into the remake sewer area, and made it into a standard enemy while the original had one as a boss. The remake versions are difficult to get around since they are much larger and prefer grabbing you to inflict poison, while the original just causes damage. I'd say the remake does these better as it brings about that survival horror element of conserving ammo for a future conflict. One of the biggest map differences is the Umbrella Lab. The original RE2 has the lab look rusty and derelict, like it's been abandoned for some time. A little bit more industrial kind of design choice as well. The remake version looks like something out of a science fiction novel, or more akin to the Resident Evil movie labs. Just a strange similarity I noticed. There's also the Tyrant having a difference in design, and it's a strange one to mention, but is worth noting. The Tyrant in both versions of Resident Evil 2 has a trench coat, but the remake gives him a little hat? I know, it's a nitpick, but it's a weird thing to notice every now and again. The only other design change worth mentioning is that Leon and Claire, the playable characters, are given a more modern design that's similar to the original. Leon looks pretty dang close to his original iteration, but for Claire... I don't know. Something about it isn't quite right. As mentioned before, the remake uses motion capture. In addition to that, the models for characters have references of real-life models. A nice use of technology, but there can be arguments for how different each character looks when compared to their past design. Luckily, if players want to wear the original costume, they can wear it once it's unlocked. As a side note, it's weird to mention unlockable items. I swear there's always a dollar figure hidden somewhere nowadays for things like that. Speaking of which, there is DLC for the remake that swaps out the soundtrack to the original music. Plus some sound effects for us. A small fee. There's plenty to talk about when it comes to the music comparison. The original soundtrack is composed by Masame Ueda, who is basically the godfather composer that built Resident Evil's music since the beginning. The original soundtrack is truly something special. It's an upgrade from the first game as it keeps that terrifying feeling with the piano, strings, a slight bit of choir in the background, and sometimes percussion to bring the chaos to the foreground. Masami wouldn't be composing for the remake, so that meant some big shoes had to be filled in. Much of the music in the remake isn't the same as the original, often sticking to ambience for the atmosphere, plus some choir for the action set pieces. Sometimes it sounds more akin to the chaotic music similar to Dark Souls. Which is odd, considering the save room music is very similar between the two. The remake simply slows the tempo down to emphasize a more calm atmosphere.
I think the changes are an effort to make the remake's music fit with the overall aesthetics. Some of the new music is heavy and thrives on tension, like the new Tyrant track or Hunk's theme in his short but challenging escape section, but even then, the rest of the remake soundtrack is wasted to that typical horror ambience of just low humming strains in the background. I will say, there are a few tracks to bring the story forward, with these light strains in the background, making a scene far more effective brings about that idea that the remake is simply a more cinematic version of the original. Obviously the scene has to be well written to reflect the effective music, but we'll get to the story later. Let's move on to the gameplay. The obvious point is that the remake of Resident Evil 2 uses a third person camera, instead of the fixed camera and tank controls of the original. Easy to use, but there is something lost when you swap out the fixed camera angles. Those angles had a purpose in the original allowing a use of cinematography to focus on an emphasis of scale, particularly for the location or feeling of openness after being trapped in the Raccoon City police station for so long. It's a difficult balance to work with. Third-person cameras can still work in a horror game like in Dead Space, but are simplistic. Not sure which I would prefer, but I'd be curious how it would work if there was an option for both cameras. Other mechanics have been overhauled in the remake as well, such as each individual zombie has become a bullet sponge now, but to conserve ammo, players can aim at their limbs to slow them down. <sighs> Oddly enough, the defense weapons have made a return from the first Resident Evil remake. Knives and grenades allow players to avoid taking damage if grabbed. The original Resident Evil 2 grants players, if grabbed by a zombie, to try to break free as a way to mitigate the damage as an improvement to its previous title. Speaking of which, the aiming mechanic is much different for the remake, thanks to the new camera. It allows for targeting of weak points, similar to that of Dead Space. Anything that glows is considered a weak point. The original RE2 had the player use as many bullets as possible to defeat a boss, and it was easy to tell when something was dead, as a pool of blood appeared under the model. The remake creates an uncertainty, as the model sometimes ragdolls to the ground, but double tapping usually does the trick. Conserving ammo is paramount in the remake, and is one of the key things to remember. How's the original deal with it? Yeah, ammo is almost never a problem in the original game. Sometimes less is more, but in this case the remake has fleshed out the combat so that there is some value to using the third person system. The way the remake treats a third person crosshair is very close to the original. You'd pick a spot and bunker down until danger started to close in. The remake allows players to stand still for a little bit to tighten the crosshairs. Any movement causes the crosshair to become inaccurate. The way players collect ammo is also worth noting. The remake actually uses a similar crafting system that was used in Resident Evil 3, mixing gunpowder together for ammo. The original didn't have this, and instead stuck to finding ammunition to get players ready to go. As a side note, the original has some sections where an NPC fights with the player, one time in Leon's campaign where Ada Wan is alongside him. The remake doesn't do this at all, sadly, so there's not much of a bond that can be established for the player in terms of gameplay. As for the characters, the first Resident Evil has pretty much been carried over. Claire even has a lockpick while Leon has a lighter. Both have the same inventory space, so managing it won't be that much of a problem this time. This has not been carried over to the remake. There is no lockpick or lighter granted for free. Instead, both characters can find pouches to increase their inventory space for more ammo, puzzle items, or something else. Much of the original game is as simplistic as the first Resident Evil, hearkening to the old saying that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. As an upgrade to the first game, both the original and remake of Resident Evil 2 put in a stun system to allow the player to get past a zombie and conserve ammo. The shotgun is still going to be your best friend in both games, as the headshot trick is still present if you really want something out of the way. It's also worth noting that the puzzles are different in both games. For example, the original game has Leon and Claire look for different items, since they'll be on different paths. It's mostly just finding an item to progress. Fairly simple stuff. As for the remake, both characters look for the same item and solve the same puzzle, with slight differences due to the path being the same. It's a rather strange set of differences when it comes to gameplay, one that makes me wonder if there was a limitation in time for development. Then there's the Tyrant, aka Mr. X. The original version of Mr. X only appears in the second run of the game, and persists in his attack on Leon or Claire. 
In the remake, Mr. X is very different as he chases the player relentlessly in both runs, being an unstoppable force that can only be temporarily beaten when enough damage is done. Let's see what the original game does with Mr. X. That was easy. It doesn't help that you can also just run to the door and escape Mr. X until the next scene he appears in. Another one of those tech limitations since the doors were loaded in the next area. The remake simply has everything connected so there's no loading screen between doors. There's also the liquor and this is where both games do well with them. The original makes them out to be a vicious enemy, not to be taken lightly, and even gives them their own introduction. The remake takes it pretty slow with some environment detail alluding to the liquor's violent nature. During the gameplay, it's much more terrifying this time. Unless the player has powerful weapons, liquors are not to be messed with, so the best solution is to move slowly because they are blind. This makes it more difficult to rush through the map whenever the tyrant is after Liot or Claire, making survival more hectic if a liquor is nearby. Later on, Mr. X is in scripted locations and will be the end boss for whichever character was picked for the second route, while the first route has to deal with Birkin's new form. This is also where things get weird for the differences. The original RE2 has different bosses for both routes, and different scenarios occur as well, such as the infected alligator chasing either Leon or Claire. While in the remake, only Leon will ever deal with the alligator, and both characters will have to fight the same exact boss until the end. Claire will face off against the G-Virus monstrosity, while Leon faces off against Mr. X one last time, only to be saved by Ada, who will save both characters in the original. Yes. At the very least, both games have the second run character face the final boss, so there's that similarity. In all these scenarios, the original game has players use the ink ribbon system exactly the same as the first Resident Evil game, while the remake on lower difficulties uses an auto and manual save system, the highest difficulty putting the ink ribbon system into play. If there's anything to take away from the gameplay differences, it's that there is a change in direction for the Resident Evil franchise from here. And the gameplay isn't the only thing that was changed. The story of Resident Evil 2 has a lot of differences when compared. To set the stage, Resident Evil 2 takes place two months after the first game in Raccoon City, the fictional city mentioned briefly in Resident Evil 1. Players can take control of either Leon Kennedy, a rookie of the police force arriving in town on his first day, or play as Claire Redfield, Chris Redfield's sister, who is searching for him. Unfortunately for both of them, a zombie outbreak has started in Raccoon City, so things aren't going to be that easy. Both games have four routes based on who the player picks first, and for the sake of this video to compare the different runs, I swapped out the outfits in the second run for both characters to hopefully avoid confusion as to which is which. In the remake, the story kicks off at a gas station, a location that was relegated to a minor scene in the original game. There's also a very impressive introduction in the remake, to set a more cinematic feeling into the story. In the original game, the story gives a brief recap of the first game, whereas the remake doesn't mention the events of the first game as much. The remake starts off with a truck driver listening to the radio, showing off probably the best looking burger I've seen in a video game. I believe you. <laughs> Just tell us a story, tell us a story. Okay, well, it was last Friday night, I was walking home from the bar, and this woman knocked. The rest of the scene is pretty good for setting up the tension of your standard horror-themed story. The driver gets distracted by the radio and hits someone on the road, unaware of the danger nearby once he exits the truck. No. 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 What do I do? What am I going to do? Then the scene cuts to either Leon or Claire. The original RE2 follows the two within Raccoon City, and has them meet in the chaos until they are separated by a crash, caused by the truck driver in both versions. The story in the original game can have different scenes and dialogue, and thankfully it isn't as awkward this time around, but there's still some strange lines here and there. Who... who are you? Oh, you must be the new guy. 
Leon. Sorry, but it looks like your party has been canceled. Leon and Claire even meet and talk to each other in various scenes. Leon even does the smart thing of handing Claire a radio to stay in contact. In the remake, Marvin Branahan's who he meets a radio, but there is not as much usage in the comparison. There's a lot to love when it comes to the story of the original RE2, some bringing that drama to the forefront between the characters involved. The remake tries to do this as well to bring about that cinematic drama, but with some flaws attached. Leon and Claire don't interact as often as they do in the original. Continuity starts to become an issue for the remake as opposed to the original. For example, there is a locker in the armory Leon or Claire can access in the first run. Anything they take out will not be present in the second run. One of the items is a machine gun while the other is a pouch for extra space. The remake doesn't have this and instead forces Leon or Claire to use a completely different weapon. Claire has a rapid fire revolver and Leon has a different pistol instead. The second run's weapon is restricted to a different ammo type, and has no upgradable parts to improve it like the rest of the weapons, plus the ammo for them can't be crafted. The trade-off is that these weapons are supposedly stronger, but I have yet to see that be the case throughout many playthroughs. The only differences in the remake story are these. Whoever is picked for the first run encounters Marvin in the police station, while the second run has some changes to solving puzzles and item locations, and the tyrant Mr. X appears at a different location. The same plot takes play, so I can't say for certain if there is as much replay value as the original RE2 does. I will say the new scenes in the remake aren't bad. The writers took time to add more drama with characters that didn't get as much screen time, including Marvin Brenna and Robert Kendo. Marvin's scenes are heavily improved. But honestly, all you need to know is that this place will eat you alive if you aren't careful. Yeah, well, I was supposed to start last week and I got a call to stay away. I wish I'd come here sooner. You're here now, Leon. That's all that matters. Okay, Lieutenant. I'm ready. Hopefully you'll be able to find a way out of this station. That officer you met earlier, Elliot. He thought this secret passageway might do the trick. Mm. This is good news. We can get you to a hospital. No, no, I am not the priority here. Lieutenant, I'm not just gonna leave you here. I'm giving you an order, rookie! You save yourself first. I'd come with you, but I'd just slow you down. Now, you'll need this. I can't take it. Stop. Him. And don't make my mistake. If you see one of those things, uniform or not, you do not hesitate. You take it out. Or you run. Got it? Yes, sir. <laughs> For a bit of comparison, the original Marvin didn't have as much screen time as he was already bitten by a zombie. This version is one of the best changes made for the remake story, adding in a character with very few but very effective scenes for Leon or Claire's character development. Just, uh, don't mind the part where you can shoot his zombie form later on. Marvin! Oh no. Damn it! Oh man, I shot Marvin in the face. Why the fuck did you do that? As for Kendo's scene, I've mentioned the effective music. And this is also a very effective scene and good to showcase Leon's character into the spotlight as he sees other people suffering from the zombie outbreak. Back out the way you came in. I think your daughter needs help, sir. Don't tell me how to deal with my daughter. Drop it. No! Wait! Step aside. We need to terminate her before she turns. Terminate? It's my fucking daughter. Ada. Just let them be. Emma? Sweetheart, I told you to stay put. Daddy? Yeah, my daddy's here. Come here. Okay? <laughs> Look what they did to us. You're a cop. You're supposed to know something. How did this happen? Huh? 
She was our sweet little angel. Mommy. I'm sleeping, honey. Okay. And I'm gonna put you to bed too, okay? Emma. Just go. Just give us some privacy. You know, it's one thing to keep the truth from me, but why him? I want to find out what's happening here and stop whoever's behind it. Helping people like them? That's why I joined the Force. Claire, on the other hand, is given some scenes, but is shown to be more on the tough and stern side in the remake, as opposed to her more caring and innocent side in the original. What's wrong, Claire? It's nothing. But I think I found a way out of here. We should be able to find some place safe if we can just make it out of town. But... Don't worry, I'll protect you. I promise. But you have to make sure you don't leave my side. On Claire's side of the story, it's not much of an improvement. The original has her meet the chief of police, Brian Irons. There's a little hint before the meeting takes place. Passing by the doorway that will lead to his office, Claire hears a woman scream. Later on, Claire meets Chief Irons, and the scene gets creepy as dialogue goes on. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I thought you were another one of those zombies. Are you Chief Irons? Yes, that's me. And just who are you? No, don't bother telling me. It makes no difference. You'll end up just like all the others. That's the mayor's daughter. I was told to look after her, but I failed miserably. Just look at her. She was a true beauty. Her skin nothing short of perfection. But it will soon putrefy and she will turn into a zombie within the hour like all the others. There must be some way to stop it. In a manner of speaking, there is. Either by putting a bullet through her brain, or by decapitating her completely. And to think that taxidermy used to be my hobby. But no longer. Please, I'd really like to be alone now. The remake has Claire meet Chief Irons in a parking garage and attempt to escape with Sherry Birkin. Irons appears and, uh, it's a very different scene, clearly meant to force players to hate this character right off the bat. And you're sure this is the way? This is how my mom took me last time. Sherry? I've been looking everywhere for you, Sherry. Brave little girl to leave your house in the middle of this mess. On the ground, hands behind your head. You can't be serious. On the ground, now. Sherry, tie your hands. Why are you doing Shut this? Shut up. Tie. Her. Okay then. You tie her up now, or she dies. What's this all about? Child endangerment, for starters. Sherry, come here. What are you gonna do to her? None of your fucking business. If you hurt her, I swear to God, my brother is stars and I will fuck her. Sherry, get over here. 
What's your name? What's your fucking name? Claire! Sherry, you come with me now, or say goodbye to Claire. Okay, okay, I'll go. You better be taking me to my mom. Absolutely. Don't listen to him, he's full of shit. Stop hurting her, please! Don't tell me how to do It's not much of a stretch to say the original does the story better. This is due to Chief Irons being fleshed out as a troubled individual at a much slower pace. Some of the notes players can find tell about Chief Irons and what he's been doing during the outbreak. Apparently, he's been hunting down survivors during the chaos in Raccoon City and reveling in their deaths, causing a deeper breakdown of his mental stability, something that becomes clear after a while in the first conversation between Claire and Irons. The remake's version of Irons feels like the shock value version of him, having him do as much as possible in a single scene to get the player to hate him. The motive for Irons is relatively the same, to keep Sherry hostage in an attempt to use her as leverage against Umbrella, since the pendant she wore held an important item. The original has the pendant hold a sample of the virus, while the remake has it hold the key to get to the cure. Okay. The problem I have with this change is partly due to how this doesn't work mechanically if, say, any other personnel in the lab needed a sample of the cure. None of them had the pendant, so I guess it was game over when an infection started to spread. Even then, the lock is already open for Leon whether he's on Route A or B, another continuity problem. On top of that, the remake has the lab start a self-destruct sequence when the virus is removed. The way the lab starts to blow up in the original game is when the power source from the lower deck is damaged in different scenarios, one being a rather brutal death scene for Ada Wan. Ada! Even Chief Iron's death got changed. The original has two deaths due to what route Claire is on, both of which are pretty gruesome ways to go, while the remake attempts to only do one of those deaths. It's surprising to see the original having more than one difference, just by having two routes not being the exact same in certain ways. The motive for the tyrant is also changed in the remake. The original version has a clear objective as he chases whichever character is in the second route, and that character is the one that has possession or is connected to the pendant holding a sample of the virus. The remake's tyrant has... Uh, well, I think his objective is just to kill anything in sight. Hard to say, as there's not much else to work with here besides the tyrant entering the lab later in the game. As for the rest of the story, the remake doesn't cover as much as the original does. We learn about what happened to William Birkin either as Claire or Ada in Leon's story, which is funny to think about. Leon is absolutely clueless until much later in the game, as his motive is just to get as many people out of the city alive. Where are you going, Ada? To the chemical plant. I have a feeling that's where I'll find John. Ada! Wait! Hey! Leon, are you still there? We're leaving. Are you crazy? The streets are still crawling with zombies. It'll be alright, trust me. We found a way to the sewer. Follow us later. Claire! Claire! Wait, wait! Man, why doesn't anyone ever listen to me? Speaking of Ada, the remake story tries a different approach with her. She tries to go undercover as an FBI agent. Okay. I can't see why this change was necessary, unless the idea was to recreate the more cold, calculating version of Ada in future titles. The original Ada is going undercover by saying she's looking for her boyfriend, John. It's only by one of the surviving scientists that worked with John, Annette Birkin, that Ada's cover is blown. Despite this change, Ada's character is pretty much intact. The change for her undercover story is the only confusing part as to why it was a necessary change. Annette Birkin also changed in the writing. Her version in the original is much more alert and focused on keeping her daughter, Sherry, safe from anyone. None of this would have happened if they hadn't tried to steal his research away from him. Where did you get that? It looks exactly like the one I gave Sherry. She dropped it. I've been holding on to it for her. Liar! Give it back to me! She realizes she has been focused so much on her work that she barely acted as a mother to her own child. She's even willing to work with Claire to find Sherry. 
the remake version of Annette chooses her work on the virus heavily over Sherry, throughout the story until Sherry is shown to be infected as well. I guess never mind the infection she knows she helped create. Now, how did Sherry get infected? Well, the original game only has one route where Sherry, after being separated from Claire, is infected by Birkin, the same monster that Claire and Leon have been battling in different stages. In the remake, this goes a step farther. There's this orphanage that's added into the story, and this is where things get really, really, really dark. Most of the information is available via the notes of the orphanage, and a few report logs in the Umbrella Lab. Basically, children were constantly tested on by Umbrella doctors, and would be adopted for more testing. All the tests were related to the viruses Umbrella makes, and unfortunately it only got worse from there. To avoid the gruesome details, let's just say nobody really stays at the orphanage anymore, after one of the children managed to escape for a bit. Both Chief Irons and Annette are mentioned in the notes related to the orphanage, making it extremely difficult to sympathize with Annette. As for her demise, it's a mix of variations, as the original has Annette died to Birkin or by a lingering wound. What happened? The remake has a continuity issue, as Annette dies twice in both the first run and second run to get scenes moving. It's a glaring problem that sticks to the remake's replay, unlike the original. There are other variations in the story for the original game based on the route, from how characters die to how important plot items such as the pendant are placed. It's worth noting that the story in the remake often puts the character into long hallways during gameplay, so that the dialogue can finish in time, while the original had the cutscenes get information across. To put it simply, the original game's routes are slightly different to each other, and keep details intact so that the second run can find them. The remake picks one route story and sticks to it in all scenarios, so the differences in the story is very small. Only Marvin or who enters the gas station at the beginning are going to be different story-wise. The ending of the story is a bit of a mix for both games. The original just ends on what is basically an action movie one-liner. Come on. Time to leave. Now? What's wrong? Is something following us? We have to go. We don't have any time to waste. Go? Where? Hey, it's up to us to take out Umbrella. The remake goes for a happy ending that's got some nitpicks to it, but it's fine. Both characters are understandably cautious of how far the infection spread, but were convinced pretty easily from just one truck driver. Resident Evil 2 has an interesting comparison present here when it comes to the original and the remake. It's one of those times where the remake is a solid game on its own, but a weak remake to the original. There's plenty to like when it comes to the gameplay and story in the remake, but it doesn't reach the same quality or the amount of content that the original has. The second scenario repeating the same story as the first is a troubling circumstance. Essentially, what we can take from this comparison is that it's possible to have a strong remake be able to stand out on its own, specifically for a different system of mechanics, plot, and art direction. Will it be compared to its past version? More than likely, and sometimes the original does appear to be better. Resident Evil 2's remake wasn't going to be the last remake the story would see. Would Capcom be able to deliver again? Resident Evil Resident Evil 3, sometimes called Resident Evil Nemesis, is one of the most cherished entries in the series, and was made back in 1999 during the PlayStation 1 era, just a year after Resident Evil 2. Fitting for the remake of Resident Evil 3 to pop in just a year after Resident Evil 2's remake in 2019. Much of the atmosphere is brought over from the previous game, filling in that cinematic design for the world of Resident Evil so we won't dwell too much on that. If anything, the maps of Raccoon City for both games differ heavily, the original spanning to at least two levels and connected with multiple streets, while the remake's map is pretty small when compared. What you see on the original map is all explorable locations, while the remake has to be cut down due to some of the locations being relegated to either a boss fight or forced chase segment. The new cast of characters are given a new coat of paint for a more modern take, except for Nemesis of all characters. 
Instead of the trench coat of the original, he now wears a... What even is that? Garbage bags with caution tape? Oh, I'm, I'm getting some certain Joker vibes from that. Never mind the face he has, that might have looked better with the trench coat. His face even starts out covered in a little bag around his head. What? Why? Could you imagine if the game simply used shadows to hide his face until an explosion revealed Nemesis? Might have been more effective. The mutation Nemesis goes through in both games after being defeated is a heavy contrast between the two. The original sticks to a more humanoid form, losing control of his tentacles after key battles, only ever showing a more grotesque form in the final battle. The remake ditches the humanoid Nemesis halfway through the game for more mutation, going from a dog-like form to... whatever that is. As for the rest of the cast, it's not as bad. Some of it is actually good. Jill Valentine's design in the original has a more casual attire, implying that the zombie outbreak in Raccoon City didn't give her time to be prepared, while the remake sticks to a more tougher attire with Jill, wearing a tank top, jeans, and boots. It's basically the tough girl version of the original design for Jill Valentine which may or may not be a precursor to what kind of character we're getting. Shortly in the remake, she'll get more gear to attach cosmetically. My problem isn't so much as the design, but rather the timing of when this gear is added in. The original game has Carlos give Jill this gear, and it actually adds inventory slots if you don't have them already. The remake just slaps the gear on as a cosmetic in about 5 seconds, gloves, pads, and holsters included. If players do want to use the classic designs of Jill Valentine and Carlos Oliveira, well, there's a, a small, small fee, fee to consider. Other than that, both designs work fine for the sake of presentation. The character differences are the biggest changes, but we'll get to that later. Carlos and the UBCS team basically have a more military design in the remake to have that more modern look. One other design to note is the Hunter variants. Both games introduce a new creature called Gamma Hunters. They share similarities with the Beta Hunters from Resident Evil 1, the difference being the shape of their head. The remake has the Gamma Hunters much larger and more dangerous than the original capable of using its mouth and teeth to crush its target. The beta hunters in the remake are very faithful to the original, as far back as the first Resident Evil, but have armor plates that can be shot off. If anything, the Gamma Hunters stick out, and I'm not sure if they match up well with the rest of the monsters. Much of the design choices are the same as Resident Evil 2's remake, but some are more questionable than others. So how does the gameplay fare between the two? Other than the similarities that are shared between the remake of Resident Evil 2 and 3, there's a few new additions to mention. Both the original RE3 and Remake use a dodging system, but handle it differently. The original has a mechanic if the dodge button is pressed at the right time, allowing a quick maneuver and faster rate of fire for a brief period of time. The remake creates bullet time during a perfect dodge, snapping the crosshair to the target for extra value. Both complement the camera angle used in both games, so I don't really have a problem with either. Even Carlos got his mechanic changed. He punches whatever tried to attack him if timed correctly, which is always fun. There is a trade-off, unfortunately. Players in the remake still have the option to shoot off a zombie's limb, but since there is a dodge mechanic, one could master the timing and not waste any ammo on the zombies. Speaking of ammo, the same system from RE2's remake is carried over for RE3's remake. The original had Jill use a reloading tool to craft ammo with gunpowder. It's more realistic, but it's a bit of a hassle to carry it for a few seconds just to get ammo crafted. The way the developers seem to have addressed the dodge mechanic in the remake is to remove defense weapons completely, and make zombie grabs have long animation windows to grab Jill. So taking damage during a grab is going to be an unavoidable risk, and sometimes the dodge is needed to be performed more than once to avoid a grab. The original uses that same old mechanic of managing space between Jill and any enemies, same as the previous original titles. This gave players a little bit of distance during a dodge, plus a shove animation, so there's some value to using it to make a group of zombies become a line of dominoes falling. As for the targeting capability of both games, the original game put in a separate button to specifically target explosive props, instead of just the nearest enemy. Obviously not a requirement for the remake since you have a third person camera. As for the nemesis, much has changed in gameplay for this guy. Appearing at certain points in the game and being the biggest threat, nemesis acts aggressive and will run after Jill if she gets too far away. Sometimes he's armed with a rocket launcher in certain areas. Each encounter is a test of the player's ability to use the dodge mechanic and put as much ammo into Nemesis to put him down, or run to live another day. If Nemesis is defeated, the player is given a reward. 
Sometimes it's a weapon part, ammo, or a pack of first aid. It's extremely difficult to defeat Nemesis in the original game, a welcome challenge acting as a major threat to Jill throughout the entire story. The remake treats Nemesis a little bit the same and sometimes different. He still appears in Raccoon City, but after a certain point in time, he is pushed to the side and disappears after certain boss fights. The original does this too in certain areas, but allows Nemesis to have his screen time in more than half of the game, while the remake Nemesis feels absent for more than half of the game. I would say he's just as threatening as the original, but once you find out how easy it is to defeat him in the open areas, it's... disappointing. I even tested the same scenario on Mr. X in Resident Evil 2's remake and was surprised at the result. <sighs> Give me a break! Additionally, the choices from the original game that either changed the route of the story, avoided a fight, changed a scene, or changed when Nemesis would appear, are completely gone in the remake due to the linear design. This makes the original game have more replayability, just with the base game. Beside the campaign, players had the Mercenaries minigame to unlock special items available for use in the campaign. So what does the remake do? uses a special shop with a point system like achievements to unlock special items. These can change little things like how much damage Jill can give or take. Plus there are a few weapons to try out on different playthroughs, similar to the original RE3. The problem with this shop is that while it does incentivize replay, you have to ask yourself if the campaign is worth playing through again from start to finish. That means doing the same cutscenes over again and going through the same sections of the map with little to no difference. The gameplay might be as fun as it was with Resident Evil 2, but I wouldn't say for certain that I'd be having fun going through the same linear structure, just to do an arbitrary challenge for one or two new items, or experiencing the story again as opposed to some of the well-made scenes in RE2's remake. Overall, I've heard people state that the gameplay of RE3's remake feels like it's just DLC for RE2's remake, and I somewhat agree, minus a few saving graces if I strictly look at the gameplay. What about the story between the original and remake of Resident Evil 3? The original story of Resident Evil 3 starts out with a monologue by Jill Valentine, talking about how things were pretty simple and how desperate Umbrella was to stay in control before the chaos started. The story takes place in the same time period as Resident Evil 2. The Raccoon City outbreak starts as Umbrella sends in the... what was it again? The Umbrella Biohazard Countermeasure Service. UBCS for short. Yeah, that. The UBCS is sent in to help with the evacuation, but things go continuously wrong as Raccoon City falls into a state of chaos. Jill is caught in the middle and must find a way out of the city. The remake takes a different direction with this introduction. It sticks to a quasi-live-action and CGI cutscene that feels really out of place, since the remake for Resident Evil 2 didn't even have something like this. After that cutscene, players are introduced to a first-person view and in control of Jill Valentine. Everything seems okay until blood drips into the scene. Literally. Jill has a nightmare probably in relation to what she witnessed at the Arclay Mansion in the first game. A new twist to show how much the mansion shook her resolve. After the nightmare, the story of RE3's remake starts in Jill's apartment with some clues suggesting the outbreak is starting just outside the window. We can explore her apartment and see that Jill has been investigating certain events possibly connected to Umbrella. Then Brad, the pilot from the first game, contacts Jill. Are you okay? Brad, is that you? Listen, you gotta get out of there! What are you talking about? I don't have time to explain! You gotta get out of there right now! Alright, let me grab my- ah! Within probably 10 minutes of the game, Nemesis shows up rushing the story to more action. The original game mentions Nemesis before revealing him, as he is already in pursuit of Brad Vickers, who encounters Jill and warns her about Nemesis before cowering away, as the coward he's been established as in the first game. What could they do? Listen, he's coming for us. We're both gonna die! What are you saying? You'll see. He's after Stars members. There's no escape! The remake version of Brad is more brave this time around, and tries to warn Jill early, implying that he likely regrets leaving his team behind. The starting chase in the remake within the apartment isn't really much to look at. Nemesis is stopped by a bookshelf of all things, and has Jill dead to rights only for her plot armor to kick in so she can reunite with Brad. This will not be the only time she gets away from Nemesis like this. 
Focusing back to Brad's role, he's been swapped from getting taken out by Nemesis to being infected by a zombie and sacrificing himself to save Jill. The writing manages to make Brad out to be more heroic this time, but sacrifices making Nemesis a serious threat by reducing his body count. In fact, the whole starting section of the remake is very linear, mixed in with some QTEs that I really wasn't expecting, since the remake for Resident Evil 2 only had QTEs for defense weapons. After that, Jill tries to go Groundhog Day on Nemesis, but that doesn't work, so Carlos appears to save the day. Hey, easy lady, I got you. Who are you? What are you doing? Name's Carlos, and I'm saving you. Come on, let's get you someplace safe. Jill is then informed about a plan by the UBCS to use a train to evacuate civilians. She reluctantly agrees to help. This is where I think it's best to talk about Jill's character in both games. The original has her act similar to how she was in the first game's remake, tough and capable with a charming heart. Carlos, I don't believe it. You're alive! I'm not sure how we're gonna get out of this town. What are you talking about? We made it! You don't get it. They have no intention of letting us make it back alive. Do you really think we can trust their great evacuation plan? Huh, it's just a piece of paper. But we don't have any other choice than to trust them right now. No, if we're gonna die, then we should get to choose when it happens. Uh. So that's it then, huh? You're giving up? In RE3, she questions the UBCS motive, but is willing to help them after hearing out Carlos. In the remake, some of the same character is present, but is also more mature this time around, as Jill is given time for more sassy comebacks as she doesn't trust working with Umbrella's mercenaries. She only agrees to work with them to save civilians. But I am on their side, not yours. Oh, hey. It's cool, we all want the same thing. Thank you, Jill. All right, super cop. Here you go. We can use this to stay in contact. I know what a radio is. Carlos attempts to crack her stern toughness in multiple bits of dialogue, whether they're effective or not. Really? Way to go, partner. One step ahead. Not your partner. In some scenes, Jill's reactions to other characters' dialogue can be rather questionable and unwarranted. This city is completely cut off. Isolated. Most of the hundred thousand civilians will wind up dead. Uh, correction, undead. My platoon has suffered serious losses. Just keeping them alive is more than I can manage. Well, you can thank your corporate overlords for that. Yes. Well, we are doing all we can. One could argue Jill is tougher due to the events of Resident Evil 1. I would agree, but the problem is that Resident Evil 3's plot has more incentive to toughen Jill up to a peak, due to how many times she's had to deal with Nemesis. An unstoppable force sent by Umbrella. You want stars? I'll give you stars. As a side note, the remake doesn't get to that line, and instead relegates it into a throwaway spot that can be interrupted by Nemesis. A missed opportunity. As I mentioned before, you can explore Jill's apartment in the beginning to find bits and pieces of her lifestyle after RE1. Much of it is investigations into Umbrella in a very unhealthy consistency. Hard to tell what she's like away from her work, so not much character exploration is available other than her dialogue and choices. Back to the story. The original RE3 has Jill go to the police station, seeing Brad and encountering Nemesis for the first time. Jill has the choice of fighting Nemesis or a retreat inside. She only ever hears Carlos through a communication device to convey information on an escape route and meets him in a diner or a press building, both times having Nemesis hunting her down. The train in the original doesn't have civilians in it, only an injured Mikhail, 
Carlos and Nikolai of the UBCS are on board after much of their forces were taken out by zombies. We'll talk about those three characters in a moment. The remake first has Jill power up a plant for the subway station, which is infested with little abominations that, uh... Hmm. Let's just agree to not explore this rabbit hole. Well, what, a, what an awful, awful thing to see. But we're here to learn, so we'll move on. The original has the same system as the previous original games. Find an item to progress and get the train running with fuel, a fuse, and wires. Jill is on her way back, but there is a segment worth talking about that got cut from the remake. Giant worm! Jill gets briefly stopped by what could be perceived as earthquakes beforehand, but it is then revealed to be this mutated worm tunneling underground. The remake doesn't use this at all and focuses on a different story altogether, instead of being stopped by the GIANT WARM! It's Nemesis chasing after Jill, so she decides the best course of action with a very unnecessary role? Her course of action is to draw Nemesis away from the train. Jill gets diverted to the sewers to rejoin the others, only to be found by Nemesis on the ladder. Hi, how are you? This is where Nemesis could easily finish this chase, but he just throws her to the side as if he wants to extend the chase with his new flamethrower. A boss battle begins at the top of a construction site. It's actually pretty fun in a gameplay sense. On the way back to the train for an escape route, Jill has to make a short detour to find a key in Kendo's shop. Note that this is the same locked gate seen in RE2 being knocked down by zombies, possibly creating a continuity issue for both games now. The scene isn't much to take in, it's only present to make reference to Resident Evil 2's story. And even then, it's pointless to have since it's all to get a single key. We only ever learn of the respect Jill and Kendo have to each other. Jill rejoins Carlos and the others, uh, never mind, Nemesis comes back for round, uh, six? Is it six? Oh, come on. Not again. Yes, round six. This is as close as Nemesis gets to the old version of himself, immediately back for another fight. This time, he's got a rocket launcher, but instead of fighting, it's suggested to run toward a gas station where Carlos has a trap set. By the way, there's a few times Jill takes a few hits throughout this segment in cutscenes, and this is officially where I stopped worrying if Jill would be in any real danger since, you know, cutscene. It really detracts from how much hell Jill is going through, None of the action builds any tension, and thus the story's cutscenes start to feel like Michael Bay's explosion extravaganza. Let's get back to the other characters now that they're here. Mikhail is portrayed in the original as one of the leaders of a squad that got slaughtered by zombies. He is scarred mentally by the event, but he is trying his best to make up for losing his squad. Mikhail, do you have some kind of death wish? My people, they were wiped out by these monsters. I can't stop just because I'm wounded! But can't you see those monsters are also the victims of Umbrella? Are you accusing me of taking it out on them? You don't seem to understand something. We're not really involved with the company! There's no reason for any of us to take responsibility for this mess! I know that. And right now, that's the only reason why I'm trying to cooperate with you. Uh, sorry. I feel so useless. Don't. You fought hard and have the wounds to prove it. But... I'm still alive. My men aren't. Don't think about that now. Just rest. The remake has him as a confident leader willing to keep his head up, despite an injury holding him back from joining his allies. Both games have him sacrifice himself after Nemesis appears, the remake making it far more epic than the original. Get off my train. Shit, 
Carlos is portrayed in the original as a confident and often positive character, keeping his cool in the chaos. The remake does the same, but with a different voice accent, but I'm not complaining. The character's mannerisms are still present. Relax. I'm not dead yet. Are you okay? I'm fine. Uh, that hero stuff is harder than it looks. This isn't the last ride out of town, right? Do not worry. Once the civilians are safe, the train will be back. It's all right. You're going ahead. I'm not going to die on you and leave you in a cold, cruel, Carlosless world. Okay. Lastly, there's Nikolai, who is revealed as a minor antagonist in the original game, seen an opportunity to perform covert actions and research for Umbrella as a monitor after eliminating most of the UBCS forces, and seen how much money he could get for killing Jill in one later scene. The amount is modest, but there is a reward to be claimed upon the confirmation of your death. That's great, except I have no intention of contributing to your retirement fund. Before that, he's willing to work with Jill to escape on the train. In some scenes, he's shown to be hiding his motive from others. Wait! What did you do? I had no choice. He was about to turn into a zombie. It would have been a threat, so I eliminated it. But he was still conscious, wasn't he? He was as good as dead. And it took fewer bullets to kill him now than it would have if he had transformed. The remake version of Nikolai is an obvious villain all the way through the story. He talks about survival instincts and money to other characters, and acts as the final antagonist instead of Nemesis, further diminishing his role. Focusing back on the story, the train is destroyed in both games, but different circumstances are present. In the remake, Carlos is headed to the police station with Tyrell, a character that was given very little screen time in the original game. Arguably the best part of this section of the remake is a confrontation between Marvin from RE2 with the now zombified Brad Vickers, giving more weight to the story in RE2. Sorry. Sorry. And be careful. If you see one of those things, no matter who they were, you can't hesitate. Take them out if you can. Or you run. Good news for that game, but it does beg the question as to why Jill couldn't head to the station and share a scene with Marvin to benefit both stories of RE2 and RE3. As for the original RE3, this is where things are cut once again when compared to the remake. The clock tower from the original game has been cut completely in favor of a boss battle with Nemesis. There's a neat line from Jill before it, but that's about it. The scene after beating him has one of the silliest sound bites I've ever heard in a Resident Evil game. There's also a scene that feels off after beating this boss. It's like an actor trying really hard to perform in front of something that's not there, added in later for CGI. Right, let's do this. Which can easily be replaced with this kind of dialogue. If you want blood fat, I don't want to play your hands. That was weird. After the fight, Chill is infected by Nemesis and later taunted by good old Nikolai. The original's version of this boss battle takes place after a failed helicopter rescue that was thwarted by Nemesis. The infection still occurs, but Carlos is close by to rescue Jill and to find a cure. Remix version has Carlos rescue Jill at what I think is daylight? It's hard to tell since things swap back to night later on, so that might have been just some light source, even though the game said the time lapse was half a day later. How Jill isn't dead is a mystery. Carlos takes Jill to a hospital where Dr. Bard is at and a possible cure. I will say the remake does this a bit better since the clock tower in the original is conveniently close to the hospital. You might be wondering what Dr. Bard's importance to the plot is. Bard. Yeah, not much. Who knows why he was added into the story. In comparison, the original has Carlos create the cure himself while the remake version has one in stock. 
convenient. Once Jill is cured, the remake has Carlos hold out in the hospital. So much for survival horror, right? After that, Carlos is informed by Tyrell that Raccoon City will be bombed in a final effort to remove the zombie outbreak. The original has Carlos go through the clock tower with Nemesis hot on the trail. It's only much later on that Carlos learns about the bombing. I thought for a second this would be similar to the previous fight, but that didn't work out well, so... Nemesis now has a few new moves if Carlos fights him. Nemesis gets closer to Jill since his interest in Carlos is very little. It's best to run past him. After curing Jill, we'll be back in control of her. She'll have to traverse through a park and a graveyard leading to a boss fight with the Giant Noir! Thank you. Then the story leads to a facility where a helicopter is. Briefly, Jill will have to deal with Nemesis until another boss battle. She can either jump into a river or push Nemesis off. Okay. Either way leads to a different section of the map. The remake first has Jill go through another nightmare. This one involving an infected Carlos because... reasons, I guess. There's one detail to note, which is that evil Carlos tells... <laughs> There's one detail to note, which is that evil Carlos tells Jill to shoot him, so we'll just put that away for now. The remake then has Jill go underground into an umbrella lab, similar in design to the RE2 remake's secret lab. Jill looks to make a cure to the virus and escape with Tyrell and Carlos. Unfortunately, Tyrell is taken out by a very stealthy nemesis. Hi, how are you? Jill tries to run away, but a wild Nikolai appears to barter her survival with the cure, which then leads to another boss battle with Nemesis. Carlos appears and helps Jill fight Nemesis, giving her a chance to chase after Nikolai afterwards by melting Nemesis with chemicals. The original has Jill either face off with Nikolai in a corridor or not at all, the former having him eliminated by Nemesis. Then the boss battle actually takes place. Jill must shoot the pipes holding chemicals able to melt Nemesis who gets slower each time he's hit. The remake has Jill just do enough damage to beat Nemesis. After the battle, Jill stops Nikolai again for a final showdown, only to be interrupted once again by Nemesis in his final form. Um... Is it just me, or does it seem like Nikolai and Nemesis are fighting each other for screen time? I'm just saying, the timing is weird. Carlos chases after Nikolai to get the cure, so Jill must defeat Nemesis one last time with... <sighs> I guess she's just able to carry that. The original had this massive laser cannon that took time to recharge and only aimed in one direction. Nemesis was much slower and easy to direct into the line of fire, as he was injured but still intent on getting Jill no matter what. The remake tries to go for a more epic action-filled final battle, with more sass coming from Jill making me really question if this is the same character. You felt that, did you? How about some more? Go ahead! I'm gonna put you right back on your ass! You think I don't know how to fuck you up? I am sick of your shit! And I'm not sure what to make of the final line she says to Nemesis before finishing the fight. It's confusing. At the start of the fight, she says, Look, just so you know, this is the last fucking time. But at the end, she says, Next time, take the fucking hit! I thought you said it was the last time, why are we having doubts now? This isn't really a problem of performance from the voice actress anyways, it's just bad writing. Any kind of bad dialogue could make any performer look bad, regardless of their experience. The original, as most Resident Evil veterans are aware of, is where Jill has her best line throughout RE3. You want stars? I'll give you stars. It's short and sweet, why change it to... whatever that was? Speaking of stars, here's a nitpick that bothered me for a bit. Remake's nemesis doesn't get to say stars as often as he does in the original, as he usually does to announce his arrival. Either that, or his music would do that for him. The last few scenes are a showdown between Jill and Nikolai. Nikolai offers the cure only to destroy it right in front of her, just before an alarm goes off to let the audience know that the bomb is on the way to Raccoon City. Eventually Carlos joins in to duke it out for a bit before Jill has to shoot through Carlos to beat Nikolai. Carlos even says, There's no other way! So it's an attempt to tie in that nightmare Jill had. 
Yay! Jill and Carlos escape in time to see the bomb head to Raccoon City, an end to the outbreak. Jill then starts an inner monologue for some reason that really doesn't fit in with this game's story. I felt empty and cold as the heat from the blast washed over us. All this death wasn't caused by a monster-making virus. It was greed. Human greed. I, 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 I guess, yeah, sure. The original has two endings based on whether Nikolai got the helicopter first or not. Carlos will fly helicopter out with Jill, or Barry goddamn Burton will arrive in time to save both of them. Then a news broadcast plays to pay homage to the lives lost at Raccoon City. Roll credits. I really don't like the way the story is presented in Resident Evil 3's remake, and I don't understand why the changes were necessary, as much of the story in the original is fairly basic. Not to mention, much of the story in Resident Evil 2's remake was fairly similar to the original, minus the second run differences. It's a decent game if you ignore some of the plot errors, but as a remake, it's a very disappointing entry for the Resident Evil series. The Resident Evil franchise has been through some strange remakes, the best of them being their first Resident Evil remake having the story barely changed with some improvements and patches of new areas to keep players on their toes. The remake for the third Resident Evil is certainly not a remake looking to preserve the original as it takes so many elements that made the original into what it was and cuts it away for something new. Cutting content is always going to get some of your player base to be disappointed. To add more confusion, the remake soundtrack has some similarities to the original soundtrack. Luckily, RE2's remake didn't go as far as its sequel did, so there is some hope that Capcom will get these remakes right if the resources are put in the right place. There have also been other franchises rebuilding their original titles, some after Resident Evil started their most recent remakes, so let's see how they did. The Tomb Raider series has gone through a few reboots, and even had a remake of the original 1996 game as an anniversary in 2007. This time around, Core Design had been the creators of Tomb Raider, starring Laura Croft alongside Eidos Interactive, until Angel of Darkness, the sixth game in the franchise. Tomb Raider would then be handed off to Crystal Dynamics, who would do Tomb Raider Legend before developing the anniversary. Starting off with the design changes, a lot of the maps are brought down to a much smaller size, which does make it easier for players to get used to, but there is less atmosphere of isolation and discovery. The locations Laura goes to have more detail to them, but I have to admit that I miss the open areas of the original game. There are secrets to uncover that give players ammo, weapons, and meds as a reward for their exploration. There's even a musical cue as a little celebration. The remake does this too, but not as much as the original does, closing the maps inward and removing some areas. Laura Croft and the rest of the cast have been updated from that old polygon design, which will always have that nostalgic charm. Some of the henchmen Laura has to fight are… well, we'll just say they're a different bunch now. Some have been modernized from their older designs to fit into their new characters. Some are psychotic, and some are your standard tough guy act. Oh, and there's a skateboard guy somewhere in there. As for our protagonist, she's modeled similarly to her design in Legend, mixed with most of the same design as the original. One specific detail all the designs share is that the original uses more vibrant colors, while the remake decides to tone down the colors for a worn down and abandoned palette, which in hindsight really makes the locations feel... meh. 
Instead of that feeling of discovery one would get when taken in the world, some of the original locations have been weaved into the map with some new additions to keep things fresh and new. The location that arguably got the biggest change was the final levels in Atlantis. And not that happy kind of Atlantis. This kind of Atlantis. Okay. Bit of a spoiler, but it's such a shift to compare. The original has this creepy lava plus muscle and stone build going on that it's leaning toward the horror genre. The remake just turns it into lava, runic stone, and well, it looks like the Doom Slayer might show up for a second or two. Both are striking enough to be memorable, but the jump in design is more apparent in the original than the remake. If there was anything that I'd noticed appearing more in the remake than the original is hallways. Lots and lots of hallways. Not sure if reusing hallways is a good idea since it can come across as lazy map design. There's usually a small puzzle or obstacle to cross, but that's about it. The music is pretty good for the original game despite how minimal it is. Many tracks get that sense of awe and wonder across during exploration. remake has a few decent tracks, but only so few are as good as the original. Particularly Laura's Mansion has a wondrous musical background. The mansion is one of the new locales to explore with small challenges to test yourself on. This can get players familiar with the mechanics, but it's recommended to do the campaign first. As for gameplay, there's a pretty good movement tutorial in Laura's Mansion in the original. There's plenty of practice to do to get players familiar with the mechanics. As for the remake, there is still the mansion, but it's not a tutorial area that teaches the player. Instead, the first level has tutorial pop-ups to get players familiar with the controls. This version sticks to a parkour style of platforming, using ledges and platforms to progress. The original uses what is called the grid system, using box-shaped platforms for players to use with the movement system to grab ledges, jump off of ramps for a boost, and more. It's the basic framework for the tank controls on Laura, as players traverse throughout various locations. It's a very impressive system for its time, and very rewarding to players willing to explore far and wide. This system isn't without flaws, however. Switches and items have a precise spot they can be interacted with and get needlessly frustrating to work with as players reposition Laura to that sweet spot. Not to mention how punishing the game can be for a mistake and the amount of trial and error that takes place in the later half. Since autosave wasn't a thing in the original Tomb Raider game, there's save points placed at certain areas. Even with these save points, the platforming is unforgiving with mistakes. Precision and patience is the best way to progress as the challenge gets more difficult if the player rushes forward, without planning ahead. As for the jumping mechanic, the animation has a slight delay before starting the actual jump, 
so if a puzzle is timed, then it's likely a jump will fail if not timed precisely. A bit frustrating, but there aren't many timed puzzles to get through. For combat, the original game doesn't inform the player how it works. Laura can't grab onto ledges with any weapons, making her helpless if something attacks her during the animation. Otherwise, Laura will automatically aim at the nearest enemy in front of her. There's a lock-on mechanic, but both sometimes fight the camera and make things unnecessarily messy. There's a lot of puzzles in the original that involve moving a box, pulling a switch, and finding keys, which is nice, but there is not much of a direction to follow or help out players that might be discouraged to progress on their own. The idea is that the game has a much slower pace, encouraging exploration around every possible corner. Much of the remake does the same with a faster pace, along with a journal that allows Laura Croft to give a hint as to what might solve a puzzle. On top of that, the mechanics have new additions. There's a grappling hook now on Laura's gear, along with some platforming that often tests her balance. Back to the combat. This is where the remake tries to improve what came before, along with an occasional boss battle. The original didn't have these sections and were more instantaneous without a cutscene to lead into the encounter. Additionally, Laura will be facing against animals and sometimes humans in the original game. Fighting the henchmen in the original game is one of the most boring parts of the game. Combat is not its strong suit since it can be dumbed down to shoot continuously and heal, or just get behind who is shooting at you only to put about 50 more bullets into them. As for the remake? They're QTEs. Yay. I'm not a fan of QTEs in cutscenes. They often break up the scene for a button to be pressed, and the same applies for this game, especially in crucial character moments. The combat in the remake also puts in a dodge system, also present in the original but can really mess up the camera. It's best to use it if the camera needs to be repositioned. If enough damage is done to an enemy, a rage bar is filled up and queues up an attack requiring a precise dodge which then allows Laura to instantly take out the aggressor. This can be useful to make combat easier as long as enemies don't attack as a group, otherwise the dodge mechanic is useless. Boss battles also have the rage bar, with some having a unique mechanic as to how they can be beaten. With this, it's pretty clear the remake is going for a more action-driven style of gameplay instead of the platformer of old. Combat is easier, but with the smaller maps, there is a lot sacrificed for an easier challenge. Neither game is similar to the other apart from the design and story. Much of the same plot points occur with some changes made to the original in an effort to flesh out Laura's character. Before getting introduced to our cast, we're shown that a massive explosion occurs in New Mexico, and a chamber releases a humanoid figure. Cut to the main premise of the story, where Laura Croft is hired by Jacqueline Natla to locate an artifact in Peru. Both scenes are pretty similar to get to the same end goal. However, there's a few dialogue changes here and there. She's bright and beautiful. <laughs> Seal it, Larson. Ma'am. Feast your eyes on this, Laura. How does that make your wallet rumble? I'm sorry. I only play for sport. Then you'll like a big park. Peru. Laura Croft, meet Jacqueline Natla of Natla Technologies. Good afternoon, Miss Croft. My research department has recently turned its focus to the study of ancient artifacts, and I'm led to believe that, with the right incentive, you're just the woman to find them for me. I'm afraid you've been misled. I only play for sport. Which is precisely why I've come to you, Miss Croft. This is a game you've played before, with your father. The next scene starts in Peru, where a cutscene plays in the original, and gameplay starts for the remake to be the tutorial segment. Both times, Laura's guide is killed by wolves, and here is where the character of Laura differs a little. The remake shows signs of regretting her companion's death, while the original is more... eh, moving on. We'll get more to compare in a moment. Laura succeeds in her retrieval of the artifact, but is confronted by Larson, who is here to steal it from Laura. We find out that the artifact is only a piece of a much larger one. Both scenes get to the point, but here's where another difference is present in Laura's character. The original has her act clever enough to get what she wants. The remake version of this scene is trying its best to recreate that version of Laura. It's not bad, but it could be better. Well, you have my total attention now. I'm not quite sure if I've got yours, though. Hello? I'll heal and hide you to a barn door yet. Of course. You and that driveling piece of the ski on. You want to keep it so bad, I'll harness it right up your... Wait. 
We're talking about the artifact here? Damn straight we are. Right up. Hold on. I I'm sorry. This piece, you say? Where's the rest? Miss Natler put Pierre Dupont on that trail. And where is that? Ha! <laughs> you ain't fast enough for him. So you think all this talking is just holding me up? I don't know where his little jackrabbit frog legs are running him to. You'll have to ask Miss Natler. Thank you. I will. This is only one piece of the skion. Where's the rest of it? Give me a minute. I'm thinking. <sighs> Woohoo! Makes no difference to me. Pierre's probably already found his piece. Pierre Dupont? Where? Now that, I don't know. All right. I'm convinced. <laughs> Damn. You really had me going there. After that scene, Laura heads to Natla's office to get information in probably the most extreme way possible. Laura then finds out that another hunter named Pierre is heading to Greece for another piece of the artifact called the Skion. The original reads out a note in Pierre's voice mixed with Laura's, while the remake does a video recording of Pierre at St. Francis Folly. The remake story also makes mention of Laura's father as a cause of her decision to keep the artifact, instead of bringing it to Natla. I don't mind the change, but it does sound like it's been thrown in instead of fleshed out in a different scene. Later in Greece, another cutscene plays in the remake, after a short battle in-game, to flesh out Pierre's character. He's shown to be a competitive hunter willing to keep Laura alive in case she figures out the puzzles faster than he does. A means to an end sort of thing. The original gets straight into the action with lions attacking Laura and eventually Pierre, who despawns behind a wall after enough damage is done. The next scene plays out differently, and I'll say the original plays this well. This is where the tone of the game shifts dramatically. This is where the first of many mysterious forces from Atlantis start to show up, and it's a huge surprise to anyone that's gotten used to the enemy roster of wild animals and henchmen. After that fight, Laura has to kill Pierre in the main chamber to get the second part of the Skion artifact. The way the remake plays this cutscene is interesting since this version of Laura isn't in favor of killing anyone. I have a mixed feeling of wondering what the intended direction for this scene was. After putting the two pieces together, Laura gets a vision related to the Kingdom of Atlantis. The original game has no dialogue to suggest this, so most of it is implied information by visual storytelling, while the remake just spits the story out with dialogue while Laura floats in the foreground. Obviously this means the original has more mystery to discover than the remake. Laura then travels to Egypt for the final Skion piece. The remake gives Laura a vision again. This time it shows two Atlantis rulers judging a traitor who is revealed to be Natla as a twist. Funny thing to mention now that I think about it. The characters are voiced by Steve Blum, Grey Delisle, and Alistair Duncan. So imagine Wolverine and Mimir judging Daphne for losing the mystery machine. 
After the vision, Laura is surrounded and forced to hand over the Skion to Natla and her allies. Natla even states she was once the Queen of Atlantis with her hired help and earshot. No reaction from any of them, sadly. In the original version, the twist is not shown, so players are left to believe an evil company is after the secrets of Atlantis. Laura escapes, another QTE in the remake, and hitches a ride onto Natla's ship as it heads to whatever's left of Atlantis. Once again, the remake takes things in a different direction, as the original has Laura going through a system of mines, and taken out each of Natla's allies, minus Larson who was taken down in Egypt. Laura's conflict with killing another person in the remake is dealt with once Larson gets in her way. And I actually like this scene, minus the QTEs. There's actually some character development out of Laura here, as she reacts disgusted with the blood on her hands. Or imaginary blood, since the game doesn't have any. Later on, she confronts Kate and Jerome. Kate is portrayed as a sadistic, knife-wielding maniac who thrives on making others suffer. As for Jerome, well, he's Jerome. The fight is another QTE with a twist of the story. Cade wants to be the one to kill Laura, so he takes out Jerome during the fight, but as soon as he gets the chance, Jerome shoots Cade. There's a subplot missing here that players can actually read up on in the menu bios. Both Cade and Jerome have a bitter rivalry, apparently. Would've been nice to see that, but oh well, I guess. Laura makes her way to the top of the temple found in the mines. She encounters a doppelganger in both games. It mimics her every action and bounces any damage back to Laura if she shoots it. The solution is to get it to jump into a death trap to progress. Cool in both games, minus the one-liner from Laura in the remake. Talk about being your own worst enemy. Everybody gets one. Once at the top of the temple, the scenes start to mesh back together as the original game has Laura see another vision from the Skion finally revealing Natla as the Queen of Atlantis. Natla approaches Laura, and here both games do a different approach again. In the original, Laura acts fairly confident this time around, and Natla is pretty confident in her plan, even going so far as to explain parts of it. Even create new breeds. Kind of evolution on steroids, then. A kick in the pants. Those runs Qualapec and Tihokan had no idea. The cataclysm of Atlantis struck a race of langering wimps plummeted them to the very basics of survival again. It shouldn't happen like that. Or like this. Hatching commences in 15 seconds. The remake has the predictable villain trying to turn the hero to their side dilemma. Trying to make Laura seem like a troubled individual just because she killed Larson. You're rebuilding the army of Atlantis. This pyramid breeds far more than the soldiers you faced. With the Skion, I now have the means to create anything I desire. What is it you desire, Natla? It takes three to rule. Tihokan and Qualopec were too weak to destroy what stands in the way of the Seventh Age. But you have the strength to claim this seat beside me. Immortality has its price. But what are a few lives to sacrifice for your dreams? This is madness. This is what you've been searching for. The answers you've sought your entire life are within the Skion. Everything you've done has led you to this place. You're here because you belong here, Lara. The weird part about this section is that the original has Lara run all the way back up to destroy the Skion, while the remake has the cutscene do it for you. A boss battle ensues after Natla falls to her demise. A monster hatched from one of the pods on the wall. The original has Laura put as many bullets into it as possible while trying to not fall off the platform. The remake uses the rage bar to stun the monster and have it fall into the rising lava below. Now Laura must escape out of the temple, but before she can, Natla appears for a final boss battle in both versions. Her original version has wings while wearing a business outfit while the remake has her design more reminiscent of the Diablo games. The scenes in the remake are a little more cheesy this time around, doing similar villain tropes like the I cannot die or we're the same line of dialogue. Selfish desire. Look inside yourself, Lara. Your heart is as black as mine. Ah! I cannot <laughs> die in the fool. Ah! Ah! Sooner or later, you'll run out of bullets. Right. It might have been better to just skip to the fight like the original. 
After defeating that line in the original for the first time, the game actually surprised me for a second after I thought I beat the final boss with a rather close shot. Didn't need a cutscene for that. For the remake, Laura defeats Natla with a collapsing pillar after hitting her designated weak point so many times, and proceeds to make her way to the ship she arrived on. The original game cuts to credits as she escapes, but the remake tries to tie Laura's arc together by having her look at her now clean hand, like she did after killing Larson. Then she sails off as she is certain of her choices. Roll credits. So how does the story work? Well, the original is fairly basic and doesn't waste time getting to the point, allowing time for Laura to show her strengths as a character, while the remake does some unnecessary changes, adding in her father and small bits of dialogue due to the new timeline it takes place in. I can't say either is better since there were limitations for the original, but I also can't say the remake does anything to improve or enhance the story. Plenty of story bits of the original do just fine with no backstory or dilemma holding the story back. Sometimes simpler storytelling is better. A bit of a side note, I've never been into this franchise and had only played the reboot from 2013 a long time ago, and had no idea what the franchise was all about. After playing the first game and then the anniversary, I'm surprised to say I was enjoying the remake more for its combat, and yet enjoying the amount of freedom I had in the original. Both games actually have some points over the other. As a remake, the anniversary doesn't get as far as it could due to the shortened areas, odd color design choices, and strange writing in certain areas. A rough remake, but worthwhile enough to take a look. I can understand why the original Tomb Raider is cherished by many. It's a challenging game that may have some aging parts to it worth revisiting. I'd probably be more incentivized to play either of these games than the reboots if I'm being honest. An interesting comparison to look at. The Spyro series is one of the oldest platform adventure series that has been around, alongside Crash Bandicoot. There have been three excellent games over the course of time. The first game in 1998, with sequels called Ripto's Rage in 1999, and Year of the Dragon in 2000, all on the PlayStation 1. There would only be a remake of all three games called the Reignited Trilogy. The development team behind the originals would be Insomniac Games, alongside Sony Computer Entertainment, while the remake would have Toys for Bob at the helm their resume including the Skylanders franchise, a spin-off of the Spyro games. We'll be focusing on Year of the Dragon, the third game, since there's a larger set of mechanics present. To make things brief for this section, the gameplay and story are pretty much the same. Some minigames are made better for the remake, while some are made worse, as some of the controls have been reworked with a new camera. Sometimes it works, and sometimes it just doesn't. If anything, you'd have to really search hard for any differences in the game's story or gameplay as some of the changes are very minuscule and unnoticeable. Much of the original has been preserved in this remake with a full rebuild of the story. Each environment has essentially received a new coat of paint with a near perfection of the same maps from the original game. The voice acting has been redone from top to bottom with some old voices returning and some new voices. My tactical instincts told me the sorceress would attack you here, so I flew in to help out. It seems my rocket launchers don't affect this creature, but I can assist you by dropping ammunition. Now get in there and fight the good fight! Uh, <laughs> I hope you appreciate this favor I'm doing in letting you out. As good of you, mate. No hard feelings, eh? Right. <laughs> I, uh, I hope you appreciate this favor I'm doing in letting you out. That's good of you, mate. No hard feelings, eh? Right! What I'll be focusing on for this remake is the design changes, and to no surprise, it looks very similar to Skylanders with a more cartoonish and fantasy aesthetic. It's not without flaws, however. Some designs have been changed for a new direction. More specifically, Hunter and many of Spyro's new companions have been changed. Hunter's old design was very bare minimum. His voice suggests he's trying his best to be a brave and heroic warrior, while the new Hunter looks younger this time and leans toward the idea that he's the cool guy of the group, so to speak. I can't believe it! How did you get so good already? Who knows, someday you might even break my course record! Nah. Anyway, I guess I should give you this other egg I found. I was going to keep it for a pet, but I can't get it to hatch. I can't believe it! How did you get so good already? 
Who knows? Maybe someday you'll even break my course record. Hmm. <laughs> nah. Anyway, I guess I should give you this other egg I found. I was gonna keep it for a pet, but I can't get it to hatch. Sheila the kangaroo has also been changed in a similar way. Some proportions don't match up and the hair looks out of place, but it doesn't stick out that much unless you really pay attention to it. Bentley the Yeti has more fur detail. Looks great for the new designs, but I am not so sure of that voice. Our genuflect to my noble deliverer. Uh, it was no big deal, dude. Yes! <clears throat> After all, it was I who let you out. Why, you brazenly avaricious, duplicitous, larcenous ursite! Why, you brazenly avaricious, duplicitous, larcenous ursite! Agent 9 and Sergeant Bird have their designs practically untouched. Mechanically speaking, the two have improved segments in their levels thanks to smoother controls, one of them being a big homage to the original Doom. Funny thing to think about since going over Tomb Raider, I completely forgot there was a character named Terra referencing Laura Croft, since the last time I played this was years ago. I thought for a second the remake would swap out her design for the reboot Laura Croft, but nah, they didn't do that. Spyro's longtime companion Sparks also got a design change and now has appendages to stand out more, as opposed to his very singular design in the original. At least it doesn't look like the... The other version of him. There's also the design of the bosses between areas. Some have lost that sharp, menacing, and darker side to them with the more colorful design of the remake. Lastly, the music is rebuilt by Stefan Vankov, and sadly, it hasn't really been improved. It's basically a one-to-one -one copy of the original, which is fine and all, but it doesn't hit as hard as the original does. Players can swap that out for the original music by Stuart Copeland if they choose so. To be fair, the original music is really hard to beat. There's just something about it that has its own charm to it.
Essentially, the Reignite trilogy is one of the more faithful and well-done remakes, the only major changes being the design of characters. Some do well, and some don't work as well. It's still pretty commendable to have the same game rebuilt from the ground up. Not many new mechanics have been introduced. Spyro has the same ability set of sprinting and using his flame breath to defeat enemies, plus a few power-ups that can be found around the maps. Each controllable companion has a unique set of abilities in certain levels. Sheila has a huge jump ability with a short kick animation, Sergeant Bird with his rocket launchers and bombs, Bentley can use his ice club to whack enemies down or reflect projectiles. Somehow. What killed the dinosaurs? Yes, I... And Agent 9 with his laser pistol and throwable bombs. I would imagine this remake was made purely for a new audience that may have not experienced the original Spyro games during that PlayStation 1 generation. The argument can be made that you're basically buying the same game that was made years ago, but with prettier graphics, and I can understand that point. However, this version has been transferred to other systems such as Xbox, PC, and Nintendo Switch, instead of only sticking to the PlayStation. There's not much room for the developers to make any changes regardless, and I think any big changes would have been met with some heavy criticism. No changes were made, however. The original game has pretty much been rebuilt from scratch by redoing the voice lines and mechanics, as if to completely rebuild upon an old memory cherished by that community. A commendable remake for a new generation that showcases how making no changes could be more beneficial. The same cannot be said for our next comparison. Metal Gear Solid, one of the most ambitious titles of the series led by its recognizable protagonist, Snake. This was also a first time playthrough for me, so let's not waste any more time and get right into it. The original was made back in 1998, developed by Konami, starting a massive franchise for the company. Boy, have times changed now. <laughs> What the fuck is this piece of shit? There would only be a remake made by Silicon Knights, after Metal Gear Solid 2 was made in 2004. There won't be much to cover for the story, since it's mostly the same. There will be other things to cover for that, the gameplay being one of the few things changed in the remake. Much of the remake's mechanics stem from Metal Gear Solid 2. Both 1 and 2 rely on the usage of stealth. The new additions include ledges to be grabbed, to avoid detection, and can be used to traverse the map. There's also tranquilizers for a pacifist run. Both additions haven't changed the game much, sometimes bypassing areas completely since the AI isn't meant to deal with it. In some cases, players can make noise in one area to draw a patrol over to them, making their point of entry easier. There is also a first-person aiming system making the combat a lot easier for bosses requiring precise hits. The first-person system also makes certain boss fights a breeze, especially since Snake, the player character, is only stunned for a brief amount of time when taking damage, causing some fights to be a matter of tanking damage. The one boss fight that wasn't changed as much as others were is the Psycho Mantis boss fight. This is one of those sections that is known by most people by now due to its fourth wall breaking visuals and mechanics. According to the game, Mantis is reading the memory card on the system, which forces the player to switch the port of the controller in order to beat him. The remake does the same trick. The only difference is that since this is a GameCube exclusive title, the controller has to be swapped between four ports. Arguably one of the only challenging parts of the remake. Even the Ocelot boss battle is much easier in the remake, since there is now a first person system making things much easier, especially if a headshot is made. Just like with Resident Evil changing cameras, Metal Gear Solid Remake adds in two cameras to use, not realizing one will be favored over the other. Removing the challenge altogether by just standing in one spot and landing a headshot with either a Trank Gun, having its own health bar, or any ballistics. You may have noticed from the design that the Metal Gear Solid Remake suffers from the same thing as Tomb Raider's Remake, dulling the colors and environment for a more realistic and cinematic style. It just comes across as ugly to look at as opposed to that old nostalgic charm from the PS1 graphics. Coming back to the combat issues, the Vulcan Raven fight is probably the one I'd say that got hit the worst out of them. The original has the player use as much stealth as possible, 
The more damage that is done to Raven increases his speed and limits the arena's pathing. Even these bosses have iframes or partial invincibility in order to punish greedy tactics from the player. The remake has an issue. If the Trank Gun is used instead, no changes will be made to the arena or Raven speed. Plus, the capability of tanking damage is in full view when you realize that it can be done, thanks to the minor stun damage the player takes. And once again, the first person system negates any risk of having to get close for damage. The biggest problem with the gameplay is mainly the tranquilizer. The story tries to judge the player for how many NPCs they've killed. It doesn't fit the narrative of war, violence, and death if the player chooses a pacifist route no matter what. Plus, it makes absolutely no sense as to why the bosses die if that's the chosen route. Apart from the gameplay mechanics being changed, the story has to be addressed. Yes, it's pretty much the same, but there is a very noticeable difference, as all of the voice lines have either been redone or have a new VA in their place. Can't you even die right? You were lucky. We'll meet again! Who are you? I like you. I have no name. Can't you even die right? You are lucky. We'll meet again. Who are you? I like you. I have no name. Some performances are just as good as the original, but when it starts to become a curiosity as to whether David Hayter or Jennifer Hale are putting in an effort, then we have a problem. Snake, is there anything I can do? Yeah, my arm hurts. Poor Snake. I'll increase the level of painkillers in your blood. Okay, but you can leave out the Benzedrine. That stuff makes me too frisky. <laughs> I guess you're not feeling too bad after all. Naomi. Please, talk to me. Say something to take my mind off the pain. What can I say? Anything. I... I'm not a very good talker. Please. Tell me about yourself. Myself? That's a tough one. Any family? <sighs> That's not a happy topic for me. Snake, is there anything I can do? Yeah, my arm hurts. <sighs> Poor Snake. I'll increase the level of painkillers in your blood. Naomi, please talk to me. Say something to take my mind off the pain. What can I say? Anything. I... I'm not a very good talker. Please. Tell me about yourself. <sighs> Myself? That's a tough one. Any family? That's not a happy topic for me. Doubt. It's really strange. It was like someone was intentionally holding it. When you were riding on it, did the weight limit warning go off? That's another thing that bothered me about it. The warning went off, and I know I couldn't be over the limit. How much do you weigh? About 135. But that elevator had a weight limit of 650 pounds. It would take at least five people to go over that limit. Look out, Snake! The guys who stole my stealth prototypes are in there with you! It's really strange. It was like someone was intentionally holding it. When you were riding on it, did the weight limit warning go off? That's another thing that bothered me about it. The warning went off, and I know I couldn't be over the limit. How much do you weigh? About 135. But that elevator had a weight limit of 650 pounds. It would take at least five people to go over that limit. Look out, Snake! The guys who stole my stealth prototypes are in there with you! This is a double-edged sword, however. Using the old voice audio can be noticeable if the quality of technology from that time has a wide gap. One example to compare is in the Destroy All Humans remake in 2020, using the same voice clips from 2005. The audio quality of older voice lines is very noticeable. There are a few new voice lines in that game, but sometimes that quality can be really noticeable if there is a steep time gap in technology or the age of a voice actor. Did you see what I saw? You bet your sweet ass I did. What did you see? Little green man in a flying saucer wiping out the best infantry unit in the U.S. Army. Right. Good. Me too. Green? Not gray? Don't be a stiff. You know what it means? 
Absolutely. What? It means the papers got it right for once. Get on the horn to Silhouette. We've got the worst case scenario. The eggheads were actually onto something? I don't believe it. Believe it. Roswell was only the beginning. The invasion is on. The same delivery is there, but if one could hear the difference in quality, then yeah, it might be a problem. An example I could find that managed to merge something like this seamlessly is Halo, the Master Chief Collection. Some of it isn't perfect, such as some environments don't mesh well, but it does use the same voice lines and manages to sometimes do better than the original. The collection is more of a remaster, so perhaps we'll talk more about it in the future. So, on one hand, developers can have the old voice clips but risk the quality of audio. On the other hand, they can do new takes entirely and risk the lack of performance. Which brings us to the presentation of scenes in the Metal Gear Solid remake. The original is very grounded, sticking to a more thematic scene so that the narrative is taken seriously. The story only ever has Snake do a major athletic move when it's necessary. As for the remake, uh, it's better if I show you. Damn! Eat this! Even some of the cinematography is just bleh. The almost constant movement of the camera plus some sound effects put into that motion is just over the top and overshadows the gravitas of the plot. Some of the shots are terribly set up, including one scene in particular that has the worst prop placement for a cutscene. It would be a simple fix to do, just blur the background or remove the props once the cutscene loads in. Much of the remake's cutscenes have motion capture, which makes me wonder why so much of the action or movement is over the top. Huh? Oh, sorry. I forgot. Damn! Oh, that's right. The way characters move in cutscenes seems unnecessary and often reduces the importance of the dialogue by overshadowing it. I don't mind when a story goes over the top, like say Metal Gear Rising for example, but since this is a remake it clashes with the thematics of the original. Even the music doesn't sound right for the theme the story is going for. Much of the cast is unchanged and has the same actor from the original. One of the most important characters in Metal Gear Solid is arguably Grey Fox, who is voiced by Greg Eagles. Even the smallest dialogue from this character is captivating. Do you remember Snake? The feel of battle? The clashing of bone and sinew? The remake swaps out Greg for Rob Paulson, who has a very extensive record as a voice actor, so I was surprised to see him here. Rob delivers a different approach for the character. 
It's not like what Greg Eagles does, but I can see the direction he's going for. Greg's version is a soldier on his dying breath. Rob's version is going for a ghost. Who are you? Neither enemy nor friend. I am back from a world where such words are meaningless. I've removed all obstacles. Now you and I will battle to the death. It's the one performance change I'm okay with. As for the scene introducing Grey Fox, it's been gutted from its original form. One implies the amount of horrific damage he can do, while the remake just shows it for the spectacle. The reason this section works better in the original is for the sudden change in music, having a more horror-filled track than an action-packed version that the remake has stuck to. As for the rest of the story, there is a lot of damage that has been done to it due to the gameplay changes and presentation. I'd recommend the original on a heartbeat if someone asked me which one they should play. After playing through both Metal Gear Solid and the Twin Snakes remake, the original is one game I'd consider calling a masterpiece. It might have been better to just remaster the original, since there really isn't much needed to be changed or improved. Unlike the Tomb Raider remake being a good game on its own, the Metal Gear Solid remake suffers from using new mechanics without making changes to the original to accommodate those changes. If there's anything to take away from this comparison, is that changes have to be made if new mechanics are going to be introduced. Changing the story and trying to do new takes of old lines can sometimes backfire. This is one of those examples that shows changes are sometimes unnecessary. The Mafia series is arguably one of the best written series in the video game industry. The original was made in 2002 by Illusion Softworks, now a part of 2K. It'd be many years later that there would be a remake in the works after two sequels were made. Mafia would then get a remake in 2020 with the definitive edition made by Hanner 13, who have been working on the series since Mafia 3. There wasn't much marketing for this game sadly, so I don't blame you if you've never heard of this remake before. Let's start things off by looking at the design changes. The changes made are mostly cosmetic, with some smaller detail changes like riding a train or trolley don't work in the remake, and much of the open world is closed off in the main story. To my surprise, the design differences are very minimal, considering the leap in technology between the two. There's only graphical changes like lighting, weather, reflections to add to the art style of the remake. The original was developed during the PlayStation 2 era, specifically for PC, then ported later on for the PS2. Which is... well, not as good as the PC version. As for the design differences, I was hard-pressed to find anything that didn't match the same effect as the original. If anything, the remake expanded on the original map and locations to fit the time period it takes place in. Mafia's technical achievement in graphics for its time is impressive, and nothing short of a cornerstone to how far the industry has come in graphics. The story takes place in the city of Lost Heaven, which is rebuilt with many of its locales available to revisit in the remake. If anything, the world differences are small but noticeable, like the drawbridges don't move as often or at all like in the original. I would imagine this is because the devs preferred to keep the player moving. Either that, or my timing just never came across one interaction somehow. This does sacrifice immersion due to environmental interactions like tram cars and trains available to use. I don't recall ever having a use for these in the original beside one level that does carry over to the remake, so I can't say it's a huge sacrifice. However, I can understand why hardcore Mafia fans would want this massive open world to have this immersion back. Dogs have also been removed from the original. Sometimes they were hostile or civil in the streets of Lost Heaven. There's only ever one time a dog appears in the remake, and it's a small detail at best. There's also the gas stations that players can use to refuel their vehicle. The original has an animation for it, which is oddly commendable for such a small detail. The remake just fades out to the next screen. These are some details that the original just edges ahead of when compared to the remake. The characters have been overhauled due to the motion capture rebuilding each cutscene, having more facial similarities to their actor than the original. Tommy Angelo, our protagonist, is much more rough in the remake, and even sounds like it too. 
Yeah, that was it. And Celieri, he finally starts talking about getting out of Morello's shadow. Maybe buying our own cops, our own politicians. The original take on Tommy is pretty much a one-note delivery and didn't have much range of emotion throughout his dilemma of morality. What's going on? What, what are you going to do? What do you want from me? I'm sorry, Michelle, but I heard that a bunch of people got knocked off because of your talk and someone lost a lot of dough. You're dangerous to us. It, it isn't true. It couldn't be true. Tom, wait! I, I didn't know I'd hurt anyone. I, I wanted to help my brother and... I knew it. This could only happen to me, a total screw-up. I can't just kill a young girl. A young man who wanted to help him. her own brother? Probably a real bastard. On the other hand, is it worth getting killed over it? Get dressed and get out. Thank you. This place is gonna blow in a little while. I don't want to see you in this town again. Nobody can see you here anymore. Thank you so very much. In this town, you're dead. Go away and never show your face here again. Get it? I promise. You will never hear about me again. As much as I like the original's cast, this is an improvement in performance. It'd be a hard sell to bring all of the original cast back for the remake, especially when one of the big characters to the main story had already passed away. And like I said, reusing old voice lines is a double-edged sword. There's a couple other noteworthy changes as well, but we'll get into that with the story. Let's take a look at the gameplay. The original Mafia has an interesting choice of getting the player into the story, with what I think is an attempt of immersion. Tommy's a taxi driver, so one of the first levels has the player drive around Lost Heaven for a long period of time, right after a chase that pits Tommy in the middle of two Mafia families fighting for control. If I recall correctly, there's about five people the player has to take around the city within a set amount of time. I can imagine this made some people check out of the game completely. The remake reduces it to three people and offers a skip drive option for later missions, if you're not a fan of driving around. Think of it as a fast travel. After that, there's a huge difficulty curve, and it's very unforgiving in checkpoints if the player has to restart. In some ways, one could see the challenge of what the original game presented, thus making the cutscene as a reward for success. The remake has a difficulty option that is almost similar to the originals. However, the mechanics are not the same. The combat varies from time to time, having the player go through a messy melee combat system that favors whoever lands a hit first, or hectic ranged combat sometimes bringing NPCs that are just as vulnerable as the player. And if they die, it's game over. Weapons have a fairly big difference too, one of them having the heaviest recoil for machine guns that I've ever seen in a video game. This values the timing of shots instead of the old spray and prey tactic. Other times, a well-placed shot can stun an enemy or the player for a very long time, leaving either vulnerable to more damage. And with the camera being behind the player instead of over the shoulder, there isn't much that can be done to watch for enemies around the corner without a cover system in place. One could argue this is for the sake of challenging the player. The remake puts the cover system from Mafia 3 into the combat. Both versions have players look for medical cabinets to refill their health bar, instead of waiting for it to regenerate. So taking less damage in a fight is more preferable in both the original and the remake. The melee system is simplified for easier use. A QTE appears when an enemy attacks Tommy, so the momentum can easily shift to the player's favor. The difficulties are varied for both versions. The original puts vehicle weight into the equation, so driving faster can be difficult. More so in one specific mission I'll never forget. There's also street laws where the law enforcement of Last Heaven can ticket players if they're acting reckless. If they continue in a chase, the AI changes tactics in how to arrest the player, or take them out if a weapon is seen. All these options except the law's progression can be turned off completely in the remake. However, if a crime is committed and seen by a witness in the remake, the law will arrive no matter what, regardless if a call to the authorities was made. Other than those changes, there's not much to mention. The inventory is much smaller in the remake, while the original has a menu telling the player where the weapon is, such as Tommy's coat for larger weapons, plus the amount of pistols that could be carried was much higher. The remake sticks to only two equipped weapons. There are some chapters that have a stealth option in the original with small differences to compensate for the player's choice of playstyle. 
The remake does this as well to a certain point, often thrusting the player right back into the opposite playstyle. If there's anything I didn't like from the remake is that the car chases often give the player infinite ammunition. Kind of an easy mode to get through it instead of just catching up like the original. It could be better, but I can concede that point if this was the better option in order to preserve the original Mafia. Considering how challenging the combat could be in the original Mafia, I would say it's simplified dramatically for a more fun experience in the remake, and allows the story to be progressed with a stable combat system for the gameplay. On to the story. There's some things to mention, and some things I won't mention since the remake is still fairly new. It's one of those stories that benefits from experiencing it. The story is roughly the same, with some details taken out. Some sequences of gameplay are taken out to keep the pacing of the story moving, while other scenes are still present allowing the original story to be able to carry the same weight as before. Tommy's story is much more dramatic in the remake, with an excellent soundtrack by Jesse Harlan, who has done some fantastic work in the past. The original Mafia soundtrack is pretty good as well, composed by Vladimir... I am going to butcher that last name, so I'm just going to leave that one alone. Both soundtracks are good in their own way, and I'm somewhat glad that Jesse didn't do a one-to-one -one copy of the original's music. Doing his own version allows him a lot more freedom of creativity, and allows Vladimir's music to be its own. Many of the same scenes are carried over in the remake, with sometimes better performances than the original game. One bundle of scenes I'll mention is with a character named Sarah, who becomes a love interest with Tommy. The original game had Sarah present for probably about 10 minutes, and even with the scene she was given, there wasn't much reason to have her there at all. The remake adds in more scenes for Sarah, adding great depth to her character as to who she is to Tommy, considering that much of this story is told in past tense according to the very first cutscenes. There are other small details to mention, some apply to the development of Tommy as he spends more time with the Salieri Mafia. The motion capture adds a lot to each scene. Actors say similar lines to the original game, but throw in small body language and actions conveying their character in more ways than what came before. In some cases, the side characters you spend the most time with, that being Polly and Sam, are much more fleshed out than the colder counterparts of the original. Then there's one of the antagonists, Morello, the Mafia opposition to Salieri. His original version is more cunning than his more intimidating and ruthless version in the remake. Damn it! 
Those that prefer the original probably have their argumentation pointed toward the more restrained and old-school Mafia boss Morella was, and I can understand that. Less is more sometimes. He's even got alternate scenes in the original depending on certain circumstances, so there's a bit to explore such as secret cutscenes and such. I'd say the remake version is much better, as he can appear like any Mafia boss or Don could lose their cool and calm appearance, something the original only shows once. As for the remake, there's some newly added scenes that would have been implied in the original. Tons of stuff that adds value to the story of the original Mafia. All of these characters, including some I haven't mentioned, get some additional scenes to flesh out their characters with some excellent writing for dialogue. Hey, hey. here for some heaters, Tom. Nah, I'm already going and healed. Paulie and me, we gotta give a beating to some punks who've been on our turf. I don't wanna pull this and piss in our own street. There's something to bust sets, that's all we need. Sam turned over some guy's warehouse and, uh... Autographed by Babe Ruth himself, the guy said. I mean, it's horseshit, but they bust heads. Your punks won't have time for questions. The original has some good lines as well. In fact, I'd say both games have good writing. Those kind of people just bring problems. You don't watch out. The next thing you know, your best friend kills you without blinking an eye. I think it's best to say that experiencing Mafia's remake story is better than being told about it. There's nothing really wrong with the original. In fact, the story is as good as it was back in 2002. The remake just delivers more and respects the original greatly. Some of the best additions for the story are in the simplest of dialogue changes thanks to the delivery from the actors. There are some side missions and scenes taken out of the remake which does hurt its longevity. A shame they aren't present, but I can't say for certain if it hurts the overall story without it, since most of the side missions boil down to finding a car in a certain location. It's nice that they were present, but don't really add anything to the story of the original Mafia game or its remake. So what can be taken away from the original and remake version of Mafia? If anything, there's plenty of enjoyment from the original. But it has aged poorly, and has very messy combat that won't mesh well with players in later years. Something the remake changes with what worked in its sequels. It's also worth mentioning that there's a ton of patches that need to be installed, in order to get the original working in the way it was intended on newer hardware. Changing the story was going to be a big gamble for the remake. So what was done was a retelling of the same story with added development and detail for characters that lacked any in the original plus new details adding value to an incredible story at the original game's core. I think it's clear there's a lot of respect for the original Mafia that was taken into consideration for the remake. If there was any consideration to change the story of the original game, it was going to be a hard sell. So instead, the developers took a route to enhance the story, gameplay, and design of the original game. It might sound like a simple method, but it certainly delivered in quality. This video may have seemed like I was simply reviewing older games and their remakes, but like the saying goes, there is a method to my madness. Making a remake of an original title is difficult, that much is clear. Taking something that is beloved by many and announcing any changes is bound to make some people turn heads in the other direction. It's a high bar to deliver the same quality as the original, something that just about any remake is going to struggle with. So what can be taken away from the examples I provided? What should a remake do? The simple answer is respecting what came before, the original story, gameplay, etc, so on and so forth. Consider what mechanics didn't work back then. There's bound to be something that didn't age well. Nothing is perfect. Take any mistakes in the story or mechanics and improve on them or make changes that are worth it while keeping the original story and mechanics intact. Unless the remake's direction is to be one of a reboot, then it's best to preserve what came before but provide some changes or additions that may improve the writing or gameplay, since it'd be a hard sell to get players interested in playing the same exact game if they don't already own the original. If the only difference with a remake is prettier graphics, one might as well call it a remaster. There must also be some justification for a remake's creation, and that usually leans toward how old the original game is and whether or not its mechanics have aged well. It's hard to say what the appropriate age of an older game would have to be to justify a remake, but I'd imagine it'd have to be at least between different generations of technology. 
Otherwise, if the original game is not hurt by its age, then the best alternative to preserving it is to just remaster or remake its design for the next generation. Either way, it's a challenge to deliver the same quality of an original title with a remake, since developers are essentially dealing with games that have created fond memories, memories that have become attached to players for many years. There are plenty more remakes on the way, and I doubt this train is going to stop anytime soon. To conclude, there's plenty to learn from the remakes I went through. Resident Evil 1 proves a remake can preserve the original to create something completely new, while using the foundation of the original. Resident Evil 2 and Tomb Raider show how a remake can stand on its own, but also lack in doing what its predecessor had done before. Resident Evil 3 shows how cutting content from the original weakens a remake tremendously. Mafia and Spyro's Reignited trilogy shows how a remake can preserve the original with changes here and there. And Metal Gear Solid shows how a remake can go wrong redoing practically everything. I can understand the argument that developing these remakes hinders creativity for new stories and projects. Hopefully remakes will get better over time. It could lead to preserving older titles for generations of player bases. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think about video game remakes in the comments, whether you agree with my thoughts or takes, or if you disagree. Next project will be a lot smaller than this one, but I assure you, we are not done with video game remakes yet, as there are a few that I've got waiting in the wings. Anyway, if you liked this essay project, click that like button. If you didn't, there's a button for that as well. Either way, I appreciate you've taken the time to listen to this video. So until next time, this is Arsenal signing off.